Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Ephesians with me tonight, please. Chapter number 3. Ephesians 3 and verse 1. The divine text says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Father, bless your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be certain that when that was written 2,000 years ago, it enraged a lot of people. Believe me, it enraged them. For example, in the book of Acts chapter 10, when the Lord told Peter to go to the house of Cornelius and go into his house, uh, uh, Peter reminded the Lord that he didn't go into the homes of Gentiles. And 2,000 years ago, they had what's called the court of the Gentiles. They weren't allowed to get but so close to the temple, the temple uh, proper. And so, therefore, they were segregated to a certain area. The Gentiles were considered by many to be dogs 2,000 years ago. And on and on and on it goes. But the Apostle Paul made it very clear that in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither bond nor free, red, yellow, black, and white, no difference. They're all one in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's a good thing. And so I'm glad tonight I can say to you that without a shadow of a doubt, that when God reveals something to the Apostle Paul, he reveals it to him, and the Apostle's not afraid to write it down. If any man ever walked this earth that had courage, it was Saul of Tarsus. Believe me, he did. But I want to mention tonight when he's talking about dispensations. And a lot of people say to me, Preacher, how in the world do you understand the Bible? And a lot of times you have so many proliferation in these Bible translations for that very reason. People think that by buying a different Bible that they'll be able to understand the Bible better. They may be able to understand some of the words in a different context, but they're not going to understand the Bible any better. Not one bit better. The Holy Spirit teaches us the Scripture. John 16, when the Spirit of truth has come, He'll guide you into all truth. So it's necessary that you be right with God, that you pray, and that you seek the face of the Lord. So how do you understand the Bible then, preacher? The Bible is approached by many, many different ways. As a historical book, for example, it is certainly a book of historicity, no question about that. As a book that relates to the history of one people, that's the Jew, no question about that. It's as clear as it can be. You open the Bible, you read about something happened 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. And this was the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. No question about that. But the Bible is also a book of prophecy. In the book of Daniel, it talks about one successive Gentile kingdom right after another until we've come to the final Roman kingdom that's split in two. And then we wind up with feet of, of, uh, of, uh, of iron and clay. And so therefore, it's a book of prophecy. And this is one of the things that sets the Bible so far apart from anything else is the fact that it prophesies. It looks into the future. There's only one that can do that, and that's the Almighty. Amen. So the dispensation is a period of time where God deals with people according to a set of rules, according to a covenant, according to some standard. But it is God's relationship with men, and it's based upon uh, whatever that may be. Like I said a moment ago, it's a dispensation. It all started in the Garden of Eden. The word Eden means delight. It was a beautiful place. The Bible said God put a, uh, Adam there to dress it and to keep it. He had something to do. He didn't sit around idle all day long. He had something that was wonderful, a garden. But he sinned. And when he sinned against God, the dispensation of innocence, which is the first one we find in the Bible, began to spiral downward. And then when Cain killed his brother Abel, it was broken completely and they were driven from the garden. And God placed cherubim, cherubim at the tree of light, life. So no one could eat of that tree of life and live forever in a fallen state. That was the, uh, that was the statement of the Lord God. Don't let them do it. For the end result will be more horrible than they could ever imagine. And so the dispensation of innocence 
when men lived in innocence and they wanted to know, as Satan said, you'll know the day you eat of this fruit, you'll know what God's withholding from you. That knowledge didn't give them power, it didn't give them peace, it didn't give them salvation, didn't help them a bit. God blesses you in keeping a lot of things out of your mind and away from you. And it's a great blessing to God. I don't think there's a soul in this house tonight who want to know exactly how and when you're going to die. How many want to know? No hands. And the reason for that is because we're not made for that. We're made to trust one that is much bigger than us. So the dispensation of innocence came spiraling down and crashed. And so what happens then? Well, we go to the dispensation following innocence of conscience because we have a conscience now. The conscience now is knows right from wrong. Uh, why? Because we know. We know right from wrong. It's no longer just a simple matter of trusting God the way Adam was. Now we know right from wrong. So what happens? Well, exactly this. Before the flood, the angels came to the daughters of men. We have an invasion of spiritual powers and spiritual wickedness. And the whole world, the Bible says, was in wickedness. And so this time of conscience doesn't do man any good either. For it comes spiraling down. And it ends when God tells Noah to build an ark and he builds it. And Noah goes from the old world into the new world. And so therefore God establishes a covenant with man to begin the third dispensation. And the third dispensation, the dispensation of human government. Man governs himself. And you'll find that governing is a whole lot harder than talking. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of people up there in Congress right now on Capitol Hill that have never governed anything. And I'm going to tell you something now. They have no idea of what a governor has to do, what it means to govern people and get things done. But I'm not, of course, so going to spend a lot of time on that. But I want you to understand something. To govern men, to, to deal with men, to govern them, govern them and, to, and, to, and to govern a society in a free order is not an easy thing. And it takes wisdom from God to be able to do that. And so under human government, what do we have? I'll tell you what we have. We have, we have uh, Nimrod building a tower un, of, uh, unto the heavens in Babylon. And so therefore Babylon becomes the seat of idolatry and rebellion against God. It becomes a seed of false gods. For when he wanted to build this tower into the heavens, he was connected with the, what we call the zodiac. The twelve signs of the zodiac. And you can, you, can take a, you can look at it at night and look at these stars. And when you can see them at night, walk out there and tell me how you can figure Virgo or Leo or Capricus or any of the rest of these, uh, of these, uh, of these constellations in the heavens. It's man-made. It's something that, was, that was, was arbitrary. It was something that was fashioned and put together. And of course, the reason it was is because it wasn't until 1400 B.C. that the Word of God was ever written. And we've got people that live for thousands of years before that with no written word yet. The Bible says in the book of Psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his heavy work, handiwork. The heavens are definitely written with a message of God. So what happens here is Nimrod, he gets up there in it and he wants to learn the, list, the, the, the secrets so he can govern over men. So he can do what he needs to do to take Complete power and authority over all the earth. If you look at this, uh, there's a number of books out there that are real good. Uh, 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 Bullinger's book on the stars is very good. And he'll, and he'll take you back and show you the names of the stars. And he'll show you the, the, the message that's in that, those names. He'll do the etymology on the name and take you all the way back to the beginning of those words. And it's quite a, rem quite a remarkable thing. Now, somebody said, well, now, preacher, you're worshiping the stars. Now, read the book of Job. Read the book of Job. And, and be careful how you handle stuff like this. I'm not worshiping anything, but I am telling you this plainly. That the book of Job, 1,900 years before Christ, before anything was ever written, is talking about the constellations. And it's talking about the pictures in the constellations. That is, a, that is an incontrovertible fact, folks. So all you have to do is look into the book of Job. But what happens with human government? Human government comes spiraling down and comes crashing. So what follows that is the dispensation of promise. God calls a man out of Ur the Chaldees. He calls him from the right smack out of the middle of the Babylonian power structure. 
out of the religion, away from those people. And by revelation, and this is so important, if you want to understand the Bible, this is one of the great truths of Scripture that runs from Genesis through Revelation. And that is that there are things that can be only known by revelation. God's got to reveal them. They come from the Lord. He tells us. He teaches us. The Scripture says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that upbraideth not, giveth to all men liberally. I was going to preach a message tonight about a subject, and I won't mention it to you because it's been working on me now for about two weeks. And I wasn't ready for it. But I may be ready next Sunday night. I don't know. We'll wait and see. But I want you to pray for me because God has revealed to my soul, I firmly believe, some things about this dispensation and this period of time that we're living in. And it moves my heart to think about what is happening. And it's happening. It's not going to happen. It's happening. What is happening? And put the dots together and connect them and you may be surprised at what you find. We're there, folks. It's kind of an exciting time. We're right smack in the middle of it. Amen. Amen. We're right in the middle of it. We're right, we're right on, the, on the cusp of the shout of God, of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ rising first. So the promise is given to Abraham. He becomes the father of the faithful. And the promise to Abraham is a wonderful thing because he calls him out of ignorance. He calls him out of blindness. He calls him out of paganism. And his father never left it, but Abraham did. And so God began to reveal to Abraham progressively, progressively. But Abraham learned. He wanted to know more and more and more and more about God. Let me tell you something. You'll get as much of God as you want. And you'll learn more and more and more about the Lord if you want to know it. Amen, folks. I've been studying this Bible a long time. And a few years ago, I departed from an awful lot of stuff that's preached from the pulpit today. And the reason I departed from it is because this book is true and I believe the Bible I've got in my hands. Amen. 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 I believe it. And the God that I serve tonight is no monster. The God that I serve tonight is a gracious, absolute, eternal being. That is, The Bible said if God be for us, who can be against us? God's for us, folks. He's not against you. He's not waiting to beat you down. He's not waiting for you to mess up so he can do you in. Not at all. What he does is lay his hand of grace out there to you and reaches out and ask you to take hold of it. And you're the only, only one that can. You're, all, you're the only one that can. You're a man. Mankind. Mankind. Adam. Adam means of the earth. Mankind. Adam. That was what his name was. And we are of the earth, mankind, but we have a greater something in us that came from above. You're a two-part being. Body from the ground, soul and spirit from above. That gives you an appreciation for the heavens that nothing else has. Do you appreciate that? Do you appreciate the heavens? That's our eternal home, absent from the body and present with the Lord. So the promise ended too. It ended when they were in captivity in Egypt. There they were. After, after the promise was given, they wind up in Egypt. So it comes crashing down. Then what? In Egypt, God calls his people out in a different way than he's ever called them. Instead of calling one man like he did Abraham from Mary of the Chaldees, he calls a whole nation. He calls a whole body of people. They're his people and he calls them out of Egypt. He said, I've called my son out of Egypt. That scripture is quoted twice in the Bible and it's fulfilled two times in the Bible. This is a pl classic example of how that the Bible is fulfilled when God calls Israel out of Egypt, but it's not, full, it's not filled full. And then when the Lord Jesus Christ is called out of Egypt to come back into the land, the writer quotes that scripture because then it is filled full. That's another lesson of how to study the Bible. Watch carefully when you're reading something, how that it may apply to that moment, sure, but it may have an application on down the line too. And that's a great blessing to understand. Types and shadows and forecasts and prophecies in the word of God is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. It opens a scripture up to us. So what happens? Well, he calls them out and gives them the law. And it is from Sinai to the cross. Sinai is the law. He, the law written in tables of stone. Not in the hearts of men, as I quoted this morning from the book of Jeremiah. But he writes it in stone. The reason it has to be written in stone is because the soul has to be changed. There has to be a new birth and they have no capacity for it. They have no way to hold it. It's like trying to pour water into a bucket that has no bottom. Water's good. Bucket can't hold it. 
Once you're born of the spirit of the living God, you can hold it then. You can hold the law of God written in your heart. I've never met a Christian who loves the Lord Jesus Christ that wanted to break any of the Ten Commandments. Have you? We, that's His law. We love His law. But we also know that His law will never save us. The law was given as a forerunner, a precursor, a preparation, a teacher to prepare people for Christ. And so the law came crashing down too when they nailed the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. There the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter number 9 that a new covenant started. For without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force. And the Son of God opened the gates. Then it's grace. From that moment on until this moment, it's grace. Grace knows no color. Grace knows no, no social standing. Grace, grace doesn't look at your bank account. Fact is, grace is not even concerned with what you did before you got saved. Grace is freely given, freely received. Grace, grace, grace. We've even got a song in the book over here. Grace, grace, God's marvelous grace. Grace so freely given. That's where we are now. And this is what makes people think the gospel is weak. They think God is weak. Then let me tell you something. It's not a matter of weakness. It's a matter of the failure of everything before to prepare you for this grace. And in every place that the dispensation fails, God reveals more about himself and about our condition. Folks, listen. You're going to be around forever. Where are you going? Well, I die like a dog. That's nihilism. Nihilism. That simply means that you've got no purpose in living except to live. For when it's over, it's over. And there's no future, there's no hope. And that's it. I passed a bunch of people like that on the, church, on the way to church this morning. Yeah. They're getting all they can get out of life because this is the only life they know. They believe when it's over, it's over. They're wrong. Yeah, when it's over, it just begins. That's the sad thing. It just starts. Nihilism. Remember that word. Grace from the cross to the crown. That's what the grace is. The dispensation of the grace is from the cross to the crown. Have you noticed how that we have wars and we have wars and we have armies and we have young men go out and put on the battlefield, get blown all to pieces and young women die and they have been dying. And what are they dying for? They're dying for the kingdoms of this world. That's why he told his disciples to buy a sword. He said the kingdoms of this world, the Gentiles, fight and scratch and claw to get those kingdoms. In the book of Daniel, he gives you successive Gentile powers, world powers. And he starts with Nebuchadnezzar. Then he goes to the Medes and the Persians, Xerxes. Then he goes to the Grecians, which would be Alexander the Great. Then he goes to the Rome, the Roman Empire that, that, that dominated everything at the time of Christ 2,000 years ago. Rome was in power. But every last one of these kingdoms, every last one of these Gentile kingdoms are spiraling down. Just look at your country. It's coming apart at the seams. Do you think America will last forever? No, but I'll tell you one that will. And that's the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray that prayer every day of my life. I've heard Baptist preachers get up and disparage the Lord's Prayer. I've heard them say, that's not the Lord's Prayer. That's just a model prayer. Let me tell you something right now. You pray what comes out of your soul. And don't ever, don't ever let anybody flim flam you and tongue you to death for what you're saying. Say what's, say what's deep, deeply rooted in your heart. That's the key to prayer. That's the key to it. You're not going to impress God with big long words. You're not going to impress God with your theological understanding. You're not going to impress God because everybody in the country knows who you are. God's no respecter of persons. One of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible, one of the most powerful prayers in the Bible. How short was it? God, be merciful to me, a sinner. How many words that prayer got in it? How many? Count them. God, be merciful to me. A sinner. Seven words, right? And what happened? He went down to his house justified. How long did it take him to say it? Didn't take long, did it? Not long at all. It's powerful. 
powerful, powerful. Just speak to him. Somebody said, well, I don't know how to pray. That's good. I'm glad you don't. Just start talking to God. Talk to him. He said, I don't know how to start. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Just pray that little prayer every day. You don't have to. If you don't want to pray that, pray, pray, pray something else. But that may be leading you into something. Thy kingdom come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. We're not going to fix the problems of the earth. So from the cross to the crown. And when does this dispensation end? It ends when the king of kings comes through the eastern sky. Wouldn't it be something to hear the shout and the bugle of the trumpet as it blows. And the sky rolls back like a scroll. And all of a sudden you're looking up and there right before your eyes are tens of millions of God's people seated up on a horse. But I won't be down here looking up. I'll be up there coming down. If you're down here looking up, you're, different, you're in a different situation than I am. I hope you're not down here looking up. I hope you're not down here with the armies of hell trying to fight against God. And when they meet in the battle of Armageddon. R in Hebrew is mountain Megiddo. So it is the mountain of Megiddo or Megiddo. And there's 23 separate layers of civilization on top of that hill. It's a tell. Tell Megiddo. A tell is a man-made mountain. It's built when one civilization destroyed, another one's built on top of it. That one dies, another one's built on top of it. Another one's built on top of it. You'd be surprised what they find when they start digging down into the tells. It's an amazing thing. They dug down into Tel Dan in North Israel. Tel Dan. Same thing, a tell. You know what they found? Hamalek, Hadavid, Ha Israel, David, the king of Israel. And the, and, and the scholars said, David never lived. He was a man-made thing. I haven't heard any of them apologizing. Don't wait. Don't hold your breath. David is there, but he's written in stone. Written in stone. Why is he written in stone? Because his son's going to come and sit down on the throne in Israel. That's why. That's what that angel said. I'll give him the, the throne of his father, David. Amen. But now when you get to the book of Revelation, you have seven churches of Asia Minor. We've had the church age now for 2,000 years. Churches. Now some folks don't hold much to this. I see a lot of truth in it. And what is that? To take these seven churches of Asia Minor and superimpose them over the historical record for the past 2,000 years of the church. And you'd be surprised at how they line up. For example, you can take a map of Babylon, ancient Babylon, one of the wonders of the world, with a wall surrounding it, the hanging gardens of Babylon. The ziggurat and all that went with Babylon. Nimrod's Babylon. And you can take a map of New York City. And they say you can superimpose that ancient Babylon right over the top of New York City. And they'll match up. Now how many follow what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? Isn't that amazing? Well, you know, preacher, coincidences happen. Sure they do. i got a bridge to sell you. It's over there in London. We got another one over here in England, in New York. No, stuff like that doesn't just happen. A president doesn't pick three Supreme Court justices in one term. He may wind up picking more than three in his first term. We don't know. Your heart ticks tonight. Tick, tick, tick. That sign of snow inside that heart. Fire, 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 fire. And every time that node sends the signal out, fire, fire, fire. You think about your heart, how long it's been ticking. How long's your heart? My, tick, my ticker's been ticking for 74 years. Think about that. Anybody have a car here that's last 74 years? Have you had anything that lasted 74 years? I was reading about my brother Jerry Falwell. How many know who I'm talking about? He was in his office in 2007, Liberty University. He's the president. He was in his office. 
Your heart has four chambers, the atrium, left, right, and the ventricle, left, right. Four chambers in your heart. The top chamber in my heart began to flutter. That's called atrial fibrillation. Top chamber flutters. It's common. happens all the time. It's not something you want, but it happens. The bottom two chambers, the ventricles, they can flutter too. And here's the problem. When they flutter, sometimes it's because of a condition that may cause your heart to just seize up like that and you just drop over and you're gone. That's what happened to him. The bottom, the ventricle, fluttered, went out of it was arrhythmia. That's what they call it, arrhythmia, out of rhythm. We had a dear soul that used to come to our church right here, sweet lady. That's what happened to her. She was with her daughter, and she looked over at her daughter, and she said, what's happening? And she tried to do something there for just a few, I don't know how many minutes, or it wasn't long, and then first thing you know, she's down, and then her heart has ceased to pump. How many of you thankful tonight for that pumping heart? Put your hand up here. Thank you, Lord, I got a good heartbeat. You got a good heartbeat? 60, 70, 80 beats a minute? You ought to thank the Lord for it. Take a good breath of air. Oh, isn't that good? You thank the Lord for it? You thank the Lord for it? I thank the Lord far more for this than I do for what's parked outside. Now, I appreciate what's parked outside, but this is what matters. But we're unthankful. So the seven churches of Asia Minor, the first one is Ephesus, mentioned in Revelation. You can go back to the apostolic church from 30 to 100 A.D., and you'll see that it pretty well matches it. The second one is Smyrna. This is the martyred church from 100 to 313 A.D. During this time, we had 10 imperial Roman persecutions of the church. When did it end? It ended when Constantine uh, professed Christianity. A lot of argument whether he was really saved or not, but I know one thing. He stopped persecution of the church under Constantine. The third one is Pergamos. I've been to Pergamos. There's a huge place like Alexandria, Egypt. Do you know what made Alexandria, Egypt so important? Exactly. Who said that? Library. The library made it so important. Did you know that when it burned, it burned all those books, all those books of wisdom and all of those old books? They were burned in, 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 uh, in Alexandria, Egypt. It's a terrible thing. They say, they say that Alexandria, Egypt had one of the most beautiful lighthouses in the ancient world because it's on the coast of the Mediterranean. And that lighthouse, of course, was a guide to the, to the mariner, to the sailor. But it burned. But Pergamos also had a huge library, probably a lot of copies. Huge library. And it also had a huge temple complex, Pergamos did to the pagan false gods. And you ought to just do a little research into it. You'd be amazed at how they're putting it together now. But also at Pergamos, they had a scapulus. They had the caduceus. What's that? That's the serpent that's wrapped around the staff. That is the healer, the healing serpent, Ophis in Greek. You know, you go back to the serpent. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. The conflict between the serpent and God, between an idol and the truth, and so I'm not telling you your doctor is an idolater when he has the caduceus or the scapulus on. Not at all. But I am telling you that's where it came from. Think about it now. Your healing is there. Your soul is there. Everything that goes along with life is there. What a beautiful place Pergamon must have been. Not my book. The high Babylonian priesthood moved to Pergamos. Sure did. Came out of Babylon and moved to Pergamos. This was uh, between 314, 590 A.D., you know what happened in 590 A.D.? The earth went into a dark age. 590 A.D. till 1517 A.D. Dark age. The dark ages, they call them. And it was a terrible time. A lot of places weren't so dark. Others were far darker. Terrible time. And it's matched by Sardis is when the Reformation came, 1517. You know what happened in 1517? A Roman Catholic monk took a piece of paper, had 95 theses on it. He took that and he nailed it to the door at Wittenberg in Germany. His 95 thesis was about this now. It was about 
indulgences. So what's an indulgence? They were teaching people that the Roman Catholic Church had built up this great bank account of good works. That had built up this wonderful bank of all of these graces and mercies and all that people could have. In other words, the church was issuing forth and giving these indulgences to people. It's a wonderful thing to have. But they wanted to build St. Peter's Basilica. How many heard of St. Peter's Basilica? Structurally, it's a beautiful thing. They wanted to build St. Peter's Basilica. They needed money. Do you know what they did? They commissioned Johann Tetzel, Tetzel to go out and sell indulgences. That meant the more money you had, the more you could send. Because all you had to do was buy some indulgences and you're taken care of. So the rich people had a time with that, didn't they? And this monk said, enough of this. The saved by grace, by faith. And he nailed up 95 reasons why indulgences were against the scripture. You know what that did? That started the Protestant Reformation. Even Catholics in the Catholic Church, many of them reformed. They saw the error of their way. They saw the error of the Catholic Church at the time. Needless to say, depends on what website you're reading, but an awful lot of them, a lot of the Catholics today, they despise Martin Luther. They despise him because of what he did. Uh, Savonarola, Zwingli, John Huss. John Huss was burned at the stake. These people gave their life. This is the Reformation Church, Sardis, 1517, 1700. Then the Church of Philadelphia, Phileo, Adelphos. Phileo is one of the Greek words for love. Adelphos is the word for man. Phileo, Philadelphos, Philadelphia. That's where we get it. Anybody ever ask you, you tell them Philadelphia is purely Greek. And it is. It's a Greek word which means brotherly love, love of the brethren. And that was characterized from 17 to 1900, 1906, somewhere along in there. I know these are arbitrary dates, but I'll tell you right now, they match up pretty good. This was the time of revival. We had Reformation, then we have revival. I've seen some revivals in my lifetime, and I'll never forget them. Never forget it. You'll never forget a real revival if you've ever been in one. How many have ever been in a real revival? I'm not talking about scheduled meetings in, in spring and fall. I'm talking about a real revival that has lasting results, where lives are changed. They say that Billy Sunday, when he would go into a town, He'd get up there and start preaching to people and said the bootleggers, the bootleggers, the beer joints, the dance halls would shut down. Yeah. Why? Because Billy Sunday had God's hand on him. He was anointed. What did he do? He brought revival. Some of the greatest revivals in the world have happened right here. The Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, the Cane Ridge Revival in Kentucky, the Great Revival in, 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 Wells, in Wales, the Welsh Revival, and on and on and on. Many of them, too many to even mention tonight, revivals. Real revival. Revival is awakening God's people and bring them back to face the truth. Wouldn't you like to have a revival? You could have an individual revival in spite of the devil sitting next to you. <laughs> yeah, this old hypocrite over here, he can't stop you from having a revival. But you can have a church-wide revival. You can have a city-wide revival. You can have a state-wide revival. You could even have a country-wide revival. Wouldn't it be something if America had a revival, the whole country? Wouldn't that be amazed? If they ran all the bootleggers off and shut down the beer joints and no more, and no more uh, gay pride marching down the street Amen. trying to seduce your children and the school system, the, the, the curriculum in the school system changes and they start talking about patriotism again and what's good about America instead of all what's bad about America Amen. and people start coming to the church and the church can leave its doors open 24-7 not have to lock them and the altars are full and you can come at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and you'll hear somebody down here pouring their soul out to God Amen. that's revival if you get a real revival in your heart your Bible will come alive again you want to read the book, you want to pray you feel something in your heart's moving that hadn't moved in a long time how many of you know what the sweetness of the Holy Spirit is like? How many of you know that you don't always have the sweetness of the Holy Spirit? It's not God's fault. <laughs> so who am I to blame? Blame yourself. <clears throat> but it's a wonderful thing. It is. I lived 27 years before I knew there was such a thing as the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit and the joy of the Lord. And that, that comes from knowing God 
that was something that just blew me away. Man, I used to sit down there and listen to Bill Cardinal at Third Creek Baptist Church. I sat on the front row and I took in everything. I didn't know if there's another soul in that building. I took in everything he said. It registered. It, it, it moved in my heart. It, what they call resonated. He put something in here, then I responded to it emotionally. That's what happened. Where'd that come from? Think about it tonight. Are you still a religious person and you're quoting the Bible and you're a Bible thumper? I told you this morning. Some of the pastors of some of the biggest Baptist churches in this country, I firmly believe are in hell. Fundamentalist. Fundamentalist. People worshiping them right now. And when you begin to read about what kind of lives they lived and how they treated the women in their church and slept with and did this and did that, don't tell me they're saved. No, 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 no. They're in hell. They're in hell. Isn't that a shame? To be that close and wind up going to hell. Then the last one is the church of Laodicea. This is the worldly church from 1900 until we hear the shout. We're in there, folks. This is not Philadelphia. This is Laodicea. The word Laodicea means the rights of the people. In Revelation chapter number 10, the Lord Jesus Christ is standing outside knocking to get in. Isn't that a shame? Let me in. Let me in. The church as a body politic may never let him in, but you can. You can. You can let him in individually. Before you go to bed tonight, talk to him. Talk to him. Just talk to him. You mean I don't have to scream and yell? No, he's not deaf. Just talk to him. Well, maybe he's too busy to hear me. Is he really? How many people are alive on this earth right now? 7,000 million? 8,000 million? 7, 8 billion? How many of those 7 or 8 billion people do you think are praying right now while I'm standing up here in this pulpit? I'd say at least a few million, wouldn't you? At least a few. The very, very conservative figure would be 15 or 20 million. Let's go 100 million. All right? I'm not saying all 7 billion are Christians, but let's go 100 million. Anybody near tonight would like to hear 100 million people talking to you at the same time? <laughs> Boy, well, that'd blow your mind. First place, you couldn't even make out the individual sound of an individual voice. With 100 million people talking to you, it won't just be a big roar. Yet he hears every breath, every word, numbers every hair on your head, knows exactly who you are, what you're made of. The only one that can do that is Almighty God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> the worldly church, it ends in total apostasy. I just read where three out of ten evangelicals today do not believe in the deity of Christ. They don't believe it was God. They don't believe. What do they go to church for? Why don't you just go out here and start you some kind of a... I mean, we could have a... This would be a good place for a bingo parlor. I mean, if you got all these pews out here, we can make a good dance hall out of this, couldn't we? Put some... Put some we could make a beer joint out of it. Listen, if you don't believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ and that church you go to doesn't believe in his deity, you're not in a church. You just as well be in a beer joint, dance hall, any hell hole. That is not a church. Now you say that's dogmatic. I'm telling you something. The Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Amen. He's God. And I'll tell you something else too. In the few years that I've been saved, the few people I've known, I've never seen a real Christian that ever doubted that statement. Never. Never. I've never known a Jehovah's Witness that agrees with that because they don't believe Christ is God. But I've never seen a Christian that denied the deity of the Son of God. Amen. How many in here tonight believe he's God? I mean, he's God, man. He's God. He's God. Hallelujah. God went to the cross and God died for you. What a God. What a God we serve. I want to read you something tonight and I'll come to a close. This is beautiful scripture. In the book of Psalm, chapter number 2, in verse 5, Then shall he speak to them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, verse 7, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. 
Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Boy, in the book of Psalm, chapter number 72, Psalm 72, and verse number, along about verse number 5, They shall fear thee as long as the sun and the moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish in abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion from sea to sea. <laughs> and we say it in our, in our colloquial English, we say, from sea to shining sea. How many's ever heard that? Yeah. That's straight out of the Bible. He'll have dominion from sea to sea. He's going to reign one day, and we're going to reign with him. This earth is about finished. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to stand up here. Lord, I say as Whitfield did, as Whitfield, one of the great ones that I have great respect for, George Whitfield, Englishman, I say as he did, Lord, that's why I'm alive, that's why I'm alive, is to stand up and proclaim your word, live for you and love you. In your holy name I pray. Amen.